It's my honor today to introduce the keynote speaker, Vice Admiral John W. Miller. Admiral Miller is the commander of the U.S. Forces Central Command. He's also the commander of the U.S. Fifth Fleet and also the commander of the Combined Maritime Forces. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy from 1979 and got his wings of gold as a Naval Flight Officer in 1980. He has over 3,500 hours and over 1,000 arrested landings or traps on carriers, and he has flown off six different types or six different aircraft carriers. More importantly for his discussion today, as uh, many of his important staff jobs, he was the Deputy Director of Strategy, Plans, and Policy for the Joint Staff in the Pentagon in, in Washington. And he is also the uh, Chief of Staff for the U.S. Central Command. So that being said, I'd like to welcome Admiral Miller up as our keynote speaker. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Your Highness, Excellencies, Admirals, Generals, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here with you today. Since I have the uh, honor and privilege of leading the United States Navy and many Marine Corps forces here in the Middle East, uh, it's probably not surprising that I want to talk today about global security from my maritime perspective. And I want to focus on the relationship between maritime security and political stability and economic progress. I realized when I was asked to speak that this could be a challenging topic, and so to make sure that I fully grasped the relationship between maritime security and global commerce, I decided to consult some leading economists. But that in itself carries some risk, as uh, I think this short story would explain. A man was walking along a road in the countryside when he came across a shepherd and a huge flock of sheep. And the man told the shepherd, I will bet you $100 against one of your sheep that I can tell you the exact number of sheep in this flock. And so the shepherd thinks it over, and it's a big flock, so he takes the bet. 973, says the man. And the shepherd, shepherd is astonished because that is exactly right. And he says, okay, I'm a man of my word. Take an animal. And the man picks one up and begins to walk away. Wait, cries the shepherd. Let me have a chance to get even. Double or nothing, I can guess your exact occupation. And the man says, sure. You are an economist for a government think tank, says the shepherd. Amazing, says the man. You are exactly right. But tell me, how did you deduce that? Well, says the shepherd, put down my dog and I'll tell you. <laughs> Rapid change is more than just the new normal. The pace of that change increases with each passing day. Partly in response to both the pace and the change itself, our world is filled with increasing uncertainty. Amazing technological advances are expanding opportunities, lengthening our lifespan, and bringing us closer together. But shrinking and flattening our world in some cases has led to increased friction, social disorder, political upheaval, and increased risk from asymmetric threats. Many of us would be willing to act on ideas and beliefs most of us would consider unthinkable, extre unthinkably extreme and hateful, would once hold these positions in lonely isolation, but no more. With today's interconnected world, where global communication is practically free and international travel affordable to most, these extremists can and are finding each other and coming together to create havoc for the rest of us. At the same time, the importance of the maritime domain in international trade and global affairs has never been greater. You all know the, the statistics. 80% of the world's population lives near the ocean. 90% of all global trade goes by sea. In this interconnected world, 95% of all voice and data travels under the ocean by cables. And this isn't just phone calls and emails. 
This is all the data that keeps the world's financial system going. So even if you live in a landlocked country, in this 21st century, you're still dependent almost absolutely on the world's oceans. We live in an age of globalization and worldwide trade. The shelves of the stores in the United States, like Target, or the Lulu hypermarkets here in the Middle East, or Cebu department stores in Japan, are stocked through just-in-time delivery with products that come from all over the world. Our commercial and economic success across the globe is tied more than ever to the sea. The economic su success that I'm talking about is jobs and prices and the availability of goods and services. Millions of people around the world have jobs tied directly to seaborne international trade. In the United States alone, it's almost 40 million jobs. It isn't just people who work at ports or on ships. Farming and fashion, energy and electronics, manufacturing of all kinds depends on imports and exports moving by sea. We analyze the impact of just one major maritime choke point being closed, restricting trade. Within about six weeks after such an event, gasoline prices could quadruple and a liter of milk could almost triple in price. Here in this region, we have three of the world's most critical maritime choke points. So all of us who call this part of the world home, even if only for a short period of time, understand just how vital these sea lanes are. Leading economists at some of our universities have linked the stability and smooth functioning of our globalized economy to the presence of our maritime forces and their collective work in keeping the sea lanes open for legitimate, peaceful commerce. Presence is what maritime forces around the world provide, ready for any challenge that might come over the horizon. Unlike garrison forces, which are called out only in time of, times of need, a maritime force's tempo is not all that different in times of peace compared to times of conflict. As a result, maritime forces get to where they need to be very quickly, and a lot of times they're already there. Because our presence is so constant, we don't escalate tensions, we ease them. No single nation has the capacity to protect and defend the global system alone. To keep the sea lanes open, to protect peaceful commerce, all nations and all people that seek freedom of movement and trade, and also security, have to carry their own share of the responsibility. A collective effort will ensure our maritime forces provide that necessary presence, whether it's in the blue water of the Atlantic, Pacific, or the Indian Ocean, or the turquoise water of the Gulf and the Red Sea. We can all help assure stability and security, create and strengthen global relationships, provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, deter adversaries where possible, and meet and defeat threats when necessary. We have to remember that collective security is just that, collective. That doesn't mean a handful of big nations provide all of the security for the collective. It means all nations benefiting from the collective security need to contribute to it in a meaningful way. It isn't just the economic benefits for our individual countries that matter. We all benefit from the, from the way that shared economic success helps us limit conflict and war. Maritime instability can contribute to unrest and violence stoking the fires of conflict. By helping to secure the world's oceans and respond to crises early to limit escalation, our maritime forces play a vital role. Maintaining the marita a maritime presence for all of us is even more challenging because of the fiscal environment in which we live and operate. This is true for virtually everybody. Like just about every country in the United States, we're taking a much closer look at our defense budget. But a tighter defense budget doesn't and shouldn't mean a reduced commitment to security. But the reality of cooperative security 
and maintaining this global system that we all rely on is that everyone has a critical and important role to play. The world is safer and more secure and more successful when we stand together. Investing in force multiplying advanced technology defense systems is one way to make limited resources go further and to have a bigger impact. In this theater, the U.S. Navy is employing some of our own most advanced systems to improve our ability to deliver maritime security. One example of this is our Navy's first laser weapon system, or LAWS, here aboard our float forward staging base, the USS Ponce. LAWS has several advantages. Unlike conventional weapon systems, which can run out of ammunition, as you all know, LAWS will function as long as power is available and the system is functioning. In effect, the system has near unlimited capacity. LAWS is also much less expensive than a conventional weapon system to operate. Firing LAWS costs less than a dollar a shot. A dollar a shot for a system that can bring down hostile armed aircraft or disable swarming small fast attack craft makes good economic sense to me. And after the success of LAWS on Ponce, we are pursuing additional technology to further equip platforms with direct, directed energy weapons. Another great example of the technology we're using here in the region is the Seafox unmanned underwater vehicle. UUVs like Seafox provide not only an excellent means of detecting underwater threats to shipping and maritime infrastructures in the region, but also protection of vulnerable undersea cables, which as I mentioned before, facilitate communication between nations and important commercial data. On several occasions in the past decade, underwater cables have been cut, in some instances purposely, in order to, dis to disrupt the huge amount of commercial data that is transmitted throughout the world. In March of 2013, a single cable was cut near Egypt, which affected Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. This incident, which was most likely caused by a large vessel dragging its anchor, resulted in the degradation of transmission of information by as much as 60% in some locations. This is a very real threat at least regional and possibly global commerce could suffer as a massive disruption at these cables located throughout the region were ever purposely destroyed in mass. UUVs can provide a very important tool to detect threats and to protect all that is under the sea and to control the maritime domain awareness from under the surface of the seas. More proof to the advantage of the use of new technology in maintaining maritime stability is the unmanned aerial vehicle. To maintain maritime domain awareness above the ocean, it is one of the most useful tools we've developed over the past years. UAVs allow us to monitor both land and maritime environments from the air at a much lower cost than traditional manned aircraft. One model of the UAV that we use in the Fifth Fleet is the Puma aerial system. It is a 13-pound manned portable system that is small enough to simply throw into the air. It has a range of about nine miles with a three and a half hour flight endurance. It is equipped with both optical and infrared cameras. Puma allows nearly every waterborne platform in the region to possess and use the system at a negligible cost, contributing or creating a network of small ships to monitor threats such as smuggling, piracy, and other illicit activity. This network of ships can effectively protect commercial shipping and enhance stability globally and regionally. The use of Puma and systems like it contribute directly to the increase in global commerce and economic progress that we all enjoy. It also lends itself to our common purpose by the sheer fact that it is a tool that all nations can operate from, from any size vehicle in order to increase regional stability. These common capabilities are tested with several nations during exercises like Lucky Mariner that we host annually. I must caution, however, that technology alone does not provide a complete solution. You cannot simply buy maritime security off the shelf. Buying the latest gadget does not in itself offer a complete solution 
as security flows from systems developed over time that involve ancillary processes such as training, sustainment, and maintenance. When one considers investing in technology to generate a military capability, the total cost of ownership must be taken into account, not just the upfront cost of a particular weapon system. It has been well said that you cannot surge trust. Maritime operations are fundamentally human endeavors. Success or failure is based on professional relationships and human decision making as much as, as it is defined by technology and hardware. People and partnerships matter just as much as platforms. Engagements between our sailors, engagements between our maritime forces, and engagements between the leaders of the world's naval forces is a central component of building those critical human connections. Meetings between senior leaders, bilateral and multilateral exercises are what build the international relationships, the interoperability, and the trust which is so essential to our globalized world. Theater security cooperation and key leader engagements directly and positively affect maritime stability just as much as the technology we use, which in turn aids in global commerce and increased economic process, progress. At U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, we conduct more than 50 naval exercises a year. A great example is the International Mine Countermeasure Exercise, the largest maritime exercise in the world, which this last year had more than 40 participating nations and 38 warships from around the world. The tremendous number of nations participating in that exercise sent a clear signal that threats to global commerce will not be tolerated and that participating nations were united in their commitment to ensure the free use of the global commons for the benefit of the entire world's economy. Working with 30 nations that make up the combined maritime force here in the region, our exercises and operations are directly contributing to the credibility of the region's ec economies as stable and reliable. I'm pleased to note the growing role of the Gulf Cooperation Council nation's role in these endeavors. I'm very excited that Task Force 8-1, a GCC maritime task force, will likely soon be established. This task force, dubbed 8-1 to reflect the year in which the GCC was founded, will help ensure a secure and stable maritime domain from the Gulf to the North Arabian Sea and as far west as the Red Sea. Working together, sharing security responsibilities, and maintaining our presence around the world to ensure the continuation of growth in our international economy, I have no doubt that together we will meet every challenge that comes over the horizon in the 21st century. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. I look forward to your questions. Admiral, curious about laws. Do you consider that an operational capability or still a science project? We have uh, completed the uh, operational test of laws, uh, although it's, it's, it's not a, a, uh, an operational system, and it was never intended to be an operational system. Uh, so what we're looking at now with laws is, uh, is the next steps and uh, whether or not we want to keep the system in the theater uh, for additional testing uh, or uh, whether or not we want to we want to take it off the ship and, and, and bring it back to the United States. So we're undergoing uh, that discussion right now with, uh, with the folks back in Washington and with the, with the test community. Uh, let me uh, cover a little bit about what we have accomplished. Um, so it, it, is a, it is a test bed um, and it was never designed to be an operational system, uh, but um, in the roughly year that we've had the uh, system on board Ponce, uh, we ran it through a full gamut of, uh, of testing. It's been a very successful test in every regard. Uh, so in terms of the reliability, the maintainability of the system uh, it has proven to be very reliable. Uh, this, is, this was an important uh, 
uh, set of data that we're able to accomplish because as all of you uh, who are familiar with the region know, it's a very harsh environment. Uh, we installed it in the summertime, uh, early in the summertime, and, uh, and so much of the testing was done in the uh, July, August, September timeframe uh, when the weather is, is, is the harshest uh, and the system performed admirably. Uh, in the testing that we did, uh, both against uh, uh, Shipping and, and against uh, uh, unmanned aircraft was primarily the testing that we did. Uh, it was very successful in, uh, in, in both of those endeavors. And so the question now is how much more can we learn in the testing? Uh, but today, you know, Ponce is a very active member of the fleet in, in our exercise programs, functioning as a, a float forward staging base. And so it, it is available for the defense of the Ponce and the units that operate around Ponce. So in that sense, it is, a, it is an operational system uh, because it could be used if, if it was actually needed. Uh, although there's no intention to, to take that particular system as it stands today uh, and introduce it. So what we use that particular system for is to learn as we develop follow-on systems uh, for, for fleet introduction. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, uh, good morning. My name is Robert Wall. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in the region, and I'm wondering if you could touch a bit on what the role you see for the maritime forces, aside from launching carrier strikes, in interdicting um, ISIS, ISIL, whatever you want to call them. But how do you see maritime for forces contributing to that fight? In addition to the, uh, the role that, uh, that um, the carrier forces or the, the large deck amphib uh, fixed wing forces uh, are already playing in, uh, up in the fight, there certainly is a role in the maritime environment uh, in terms of ensuring maritime stability. Uh, and so that can be uh, the role that we play in assisting the Iraqi forces in, in uh, uh, ensuring that uh, they're capable, uh, advise and assist uh, missions uh, in, in guarding their own maritime infrastructure. Uh, it's the maritime security missions and maritime infrastructure protection missions uh, that we undertake uh, in, in terms of Task Force 152, uh, which is maritime security inside the Arabian Gulf. Uh, our Task Force 152 is currently under the command of uh, Saudi leadership. Uh, and so uh, one of the things I think is interesting to point out is, is uh, as dynamic as the region is today, uh, what we have seen over the last several years is a maritime environment uh, that is relatively stable. And, uh, and so the free flow of commerce into and out of the Gulf uh, has, has remained stable and secure. And, uh, and so what I contribute that to is the good work of the Combined Maritime Force and uh, the, the two task forces that are primarily charged with maritime security, 152 in the Gulf, uh, 150 out of the Gulf. I would point out that both of those task forces are, are consistently uh, commanded by nations that are combined, combined maritime force uh, countries. So in the case of 152 today, it's Saudi Arabia. Uh, from 150, it's a variety of nations, including Pakistan, uh, Australia, the United Kingdom, uh, so a variety of different nations uh, that, that uh, contribute out of the 30 nations that, are, that are, are, are part of our CMF. So it is a collective effort uh, to ensure that the maritime environment remains secure. Uh, so there's always an opportunity, uh, you know, if we learn nothing else from what happened in, uh, in June of 2014, uh, an organization like uh, ISIL or DASH, however you'd like to refer to them, uh, is capable of surprising us. And, uh, and certainly what the, the, the Combined Maritime Force needs to be aware of uh, is that we want to work hard to eliminate that opportunity for surprise. And you do, you do that through a robust presence uh, in the maritime environment. Admiral, good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Brider Abdullah from, uh, I'm the uh, general manager of CISPA. 
Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, what's going on in Yemen this time and uh, how much that can affect uh, stability and strength of Bab al-Mandib and uh, how is the uh, maritime forces uh, around the region can deal with that kind of threat uh, for especially for the for the world's economy. Thank you. Obviously, what's what's occurring in Yemen today is uh, is still a very dynamic situation, and so um, it's it's difficult, I think, to predict you know what's going to happen next in Yemen. Uh, so let me suffice to say that that instability uh, in Yemen is is something that has the potential to lead to further instability uh, in the Strait of Abu Mandeb, in the Gulf of Aden, in the southern part of the Red Sea, um, all of which is is cause for concern. So from the standpoint of a maritime component commander, um, how do we deal with that instability? Well, you, you deal with it through increased presence. That's a challenge for us. Um, the, the waters of uh, the uh, Naval Central Command uh, area of responsibility, about two and a half million square miles. Uh, so how do we deal with that? Well, there's a certain number of, of ships that the United States brings uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the issue. Uh, but it's it's not uh, near enough ships to to deal with with all of that water space. And there's there are there are there are maritime security issues, uh, there are counter piracy issues that we have to deal with. Uh, we deal with a s substantial counter narcotics uh, problem set that, uh, that that comes off the Makran coast, uh, and then you add to it increased stability in, in the Bab El Mandeb Strait potentially. Uh, that, that comes with the situation in Yemen. Yeah, you can only deal with all of that if you, if you have a more collective effort, which is really what the combined maritime force is all about. So we go from having about 45 ships on any given day to somewhere today about 70 ships that help you deal with that. Uh, and that's how you increase your presence in the Somali Basin. That's how you increase your presence in the Gulf of Aden uh, to, to ensure that you have an, enough presence uh, to maintain the stability that you need to have in the Gulf of Aden, in the Southern Red Sea, uh, so that uh, the, the ships that transit through the Strait of Bab el Mandeb understand that they can do so safely. Um, so when you look at the, the three choke points that, that, that are resident inside our AOR, uh, the Suez Canal, what we've seen consistently, despite the, the, the unrest that, that has occurred in, in Egypt from Mubarak to Morsi to President El Sisi today, the constant in, in, uh, in Egypt has been a Suez Canal that is secure and is properly administered. Um, when you look at uh, the Strait of Hormuz, um, although several years ago it was the, the situation was characterized by a lot of rhetoric, uh, what we've consistently seen is the Strait of Hormuz has been a safe place to transit. And ships, uh, the number of ships, uh, the amount of uh, petroleum product that transits out, uh, the amount of goods and services, particularly food that transit in, has remained constant, and, and, and the, the passage for the most part has been safe. There's been, I think, one incident in the last uh, three years. Um, so that strait, although it gets a lot of publicity, um, has been a safe place to transit. Uh, the Bab el Mandeb uh, typically doesn't get a lot of publicity, but, but it also has been a strait that um, is characterized by safe passage and the ability for ships to, to, to consistently transit through there safely. Um, once piracy was, was on the decline, um, and that's because if you go back to about uh, uh, just under a week ago, there were um, uh, 22 ships uh, from 11 different countries that were involved in counter piracy operations in that area and included the Somali Basin and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, so a collective effort. Some of those were Task Force 151 ships, some of those were from the European Union Task Force, some of those were from the NATO Task Force. Some of those were independent deployers from other nations such as China and Russia. Um, so th this collective effort of, of various different nations is what makes sure that um, the instability that we saw at one time, one particular, particularly when we were dealing with counter piracy, uh, revolved around an unstable Somalia. That same sort of collective effort will help us deal with the instability that we're seeing today up in Yemen.
Hi, uh, Maha Dehen from Thomson Reuters. Uh, just to clarify in your answer to the previous question, uh, were you saying that there were 45 ships before and now they've increased to 70, or would you like to see them increase to 70? No, what I was really trying to say, uh, just for clarity, is from the U.S. side, uh, on an average day, we have about 45 ships in the, uh, in the region. And then when you add in the coalition ships that, that are, are part of uh, um, the combined maritime force or ships that are here uh, that, that uh, we deal with in a cooperative fashion, whether they're part of the combined maritime force or not, uh, we have on any given day somewhere between 65 and 70 ships um, that, that are either part of the, the combined maritime force or are ships that we are working with cooperatively. Uh, so um, working together to ensure maritime stability. Sir, I'm Captain Babur from Pakistan Navy. Yes, sir. I uh, would like to ask that so many nations participating, NATO and non-NATO both, so many ships participating as you have already mentioned, uh, what are the programs for uh, having a greater interoperability between uh, ships so that they share real-time information? Uh, apart from, I know, uh, Centrix and Mercury Chat and MSSIS and these, are, these types of things they are using already. Probably the biggest program that we're, uh, we're working with, and, and information sharing, I would submit to you, is, is the biggest challenge uh, whenever you, be, you begin to bring together a coalition of various different, different nations. Uh, Centrix was, was uh, a, a big step that we, we took in previous years to make sure that we could build enclaves uh, so that we could share information. I think the next big step is the, is the, uh, the coalition partner network. Uh, which will be the, the way of the future in which we, we share information. Uh, it's a little bit more sophisticated than Centrix, and, and I think that's the information sharing network of the future. We're just starting to bring that online now. Uh, it has a ways to go, but it'll, it'll be the way by which we share information in the future. Uh, and, it's, and it's a way to, I think, more, more quickly uh, and, and easily take advantage of, of building enclaves uh, that are that are geographic and uh, time specific in nature. So when we when we need to and uh, 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 must, must quickly come together uh, for a specific time and place to share information, we're able to do that. And 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 that, that's where we're headed. And we're just beginning to bring that up, that system online. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. It's been an honor to be with you. <laughs>